welcome to the Arena 246, the 2021 Barbados Athletes Commission Forum. My name is Anicia Wood and I am the chair of the commission. The Arena 246 is a continuation of efforts to support the development of national athletes on and off the field of play. In collaboration with the National Olympic Academy of Barbados, this live forum will feature a series of presentations and discussions focused on self-discovery, building a personal brand, balancing education and sport, balancing career and sport, and the transition from sport. Starting today, our presentations and discussions will take place over the course of one week. So be sure to join us right here on Facebook and YouTube over the next few days to hear from Olympians, national athletes, and business professionals as they share their best practices, experiences, and journeys. So on behalf of the Barbados Athletes Commission, the National Olympic Academy of Barbados, and the Barbados Olympic Association, we do hope you enjoy. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Ford, and I am one of the members on the Barbados Athletes Commission with Anicia. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And today, October 9th, I have the honor of speaking with three former Olympians. Uh, we have Mrs. An Andrea Blackett, who is a, a track athlete and Olympian, and, and also the the associate uh, coach of Azusa Pacific University. We also have uh, Mr. Shane DeFreitas, who is the owner of Bim Flip Gymnastics. And we have Mr. Terrence Haynes, who is the co-founder of Gofield Solar. Um, Andrea was in track, Shane was in gymnastics, and Terrence was with me in swimming. Uh, welcome to the show, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank, thank you for joining us. I know that it's a different time zone for An Andrea, so <laughs> she, she's up the earliest. It's not uh, it's not an uh, indication of commitment because I know you all are all committed, but I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, would you, uh, starting with Andrea, would you speak a bit about um, your what you achieved in your sports? Because some of the audience may not uh, understand your background, and I'll ask that for all of you, starting with Andrea, then going to Shane, then Terrence. Okay, well, just to give a Cliff Notes version of my career, um, first time I competed for Barbados was in 1991 at the Crifty Games, and I have to say that I was hooked from that moment. It was such an amazing experience getting to meet people from other countries, or even just getting to meet people from Barbados that I you know, would have seen before on the track, but never got a chance to, you know, spend, you know, few days with. So that was a great experience for me. So um, I started at the Crypto Games and then um, in 1993, I went to Rice University. Um, another great experience being in college and competing for NCAA. Um, my best finish was my senior year. I finished second at the NCAAs championships and then our four by four indoors won the national championship. So there were little successes along the way that really uh, got me hooked. And then I went on to uh, compete professionally when I graduated, um, went to the Olympics twice, um, six times to world championships. So that's pretty much a brief overview of my career. Um, I ended up competing for about 10 years professionally. So um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much. I know it's an extensive career. I remember <laughs> reading the papers and, and seeing your success. So, um, Shane, oh, um, please give the audience a bit about your background in gymnastics. Sure. Uh, as someone who's born in Barbados um, and gymnastics, as, as you can imagine, is probably not the first sport most people think of. But for some reason, I was that kid that not only climb the, the rod iron, but I would climb down head first. Um, I taught myself to, to walk on my hands. Um, in a way, fortunately for me, my family moved to the US when I was about 11 years old, which is where I started my formal gymnastics training. As, as I developed uh, quite quickly in the juniors, I soon realized I was a bit out of place. I, I couldn't you know, eventually look to join the US national team. Uh, my mom happened to be Canadian. 
So, you know, me and my family, we explored the route of possibly training in Canada. There's a, a big support system for, for sport up there. But what really spoke to me was I was still a Bajan. I was born in Barbados and, and I started in Barbados and I wanted to compete for Barbados. So I, I decided to go that route. And uh, in the end, I'm very thankful I did. I was able to compete at four world championships uh, for Barbados, the 96 Olympics. And at the 99 world championships, I had a skill named after me. So that... Uh, I don't know that that route would have looked the same if I had made some of the other choices I could along the way. I did not know that detail. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Terrence, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Good morning, guys. So I started swimming at about age five, and it was just from a water safety standpoint. I mean, living on an island and it's, it's, I think, critical that you know everyone should know how to swim. But uh, I kind of took to the sport. Um, I'm quite a competitive person, so it naturally developed into competitive swimming. Um, like Andrea, my first well, my first international competition was Carifta in '96. I got to travel, go to Trinidad, first time really leaving the country, and from then I was hooked on the competitive front. Um, since then, I would have represented Barbados at uh, you know, a couple of Commonwealth Games, uh, some Pan Am Games. Um, CAC, where I've gotten a medal and then gone on to represent Barbados at the 2004 and 2008 Olympics. Um, did my varsity swimming, as you would know, Martin, in Toronto. Um, so I had some, some good uh, experiences there with the NCAA equivalent, which is the, um, the CIs. Um, so, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I think I have a couple, a couple records still, a couple national records still, but waiting them. Waiting for them to be broken, hopefully so. <laughs> yeah, well, thank thank you all. I mean, um, what's very clear is is your excitement and being hooked and commitment to getting into the sport. And today's topic is kind of focusing on the other end of that that we really don't think about is you know getting getting out of the sport or I wouldn't say out of the sport, but transitioning out from being an active athlete. And we ch selected you guys because not only have you demonstrated success in sport, but you've demonstrated success in that transition and, you know, being uh, entrepreneurial in, in your endeavors as well. And so I would, I would like to know, um, tell us a bit about your professional role right now um, in, uh, in business, uh, starting with Andrea. Um, so right now, so when I graduated, I, um, when I graduated from college, I, you know, stayed as a professional athlete for 10 years. And then I was also a volunteer coach at Rice University. Um, I ended up, my coach ended up retiring. And so I was asked to take on the role of the assistant sprint coach. And I stayed there for about 10 years. And then I recently, well, five years ago, moved out to California. Um, and now I'm the associate head coach for track men's and women's track and field uh, at Azusa Pacific. So basically I am involved in recruiting, coaching. Um, I've done some coaching of post collegians in the past. Um, I don't have any right now, but definitely that's pretty much where what I'm doing career-wise right now. Great. And, and Shane, tell us a bit about, about your your transition, your business. Uh, currently, I have my fingers in about four different pies, if you will. And that is not very unusual for the, the entrepreneur type. Um, I was fortunate that I recognized that entrepreneurial spirit from younger. Um, so when I did go to college, uh, which uh, interestingly, I, I didn't mention that earlier, but I did that kind of backwards um, from what a lot of athletes did. I did it kind of on the tail end of my competitive career as, as I was uh, kind of seeing what the end of my career competitive career would look like. I then took a gymnastics scholarship at the age of 21. Um, I chose to do business again, just because I knew I was um, probably headed in that direction. Um, one of the things I kind of wished I had done, and I would like more athletes to keep 
um, possibilities open with is I wish I had taken more along the lines of what I'm currently doing as well now, which is the coaching in my sport, whether that be, you know, kinesiology or coaching theory or leadership theory type stuff. I wish I had a little bit more in the sport specific domain for that. Um, but I, I did definitely dabble in many businesses along the way. Currently, I coach for old college teammates um, on the, the daily in the gym stuff. Uh, my online business through BIMFLIP is a lot of personal training type stuff. I have everything from fitness people who want to learn how to do, you know, iron crosses and planges. Um, I coach adults how to do bat flips. I coach CrossFitters how to do better handstands and handstand walks. Um, and through my connections in, in these multiple businesses, I'm also developing uh, gymnastics grips from non-traditional materials um, that we're hoping to launch in the next year or so. So like I said, I've, I've kind of kept in the business and sporting realm uh, with my specialties in gymnastics playing through it all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Terrence, tell us a bit about Cold Heels Solar and Catch 22. All right. So just to rewind a few years, so I left uh, I left college in 2007, graduated with an engineering degree, mechanical engineering. But I had taken a year off from anything other than training uh, to represent Barbados in 2008. Started my first job in 2009, and I was trying to working at a firm in Toronto, but trying to balance the sport of swimming with working a full-time job. After about a few months, I realized it, was, <laughs> it wasn't practical, so I had to reluctantly give up the sport of swimming. Uh, so I stayed in Toronto for a few years working with that engineering firm uh, with the understanding that I wanted to come back to Barbados um, and start my own business. So I went away and did, a, did my master's in Sweden in renewable energy. And then in 2014, moved back to Barbados and launched Gold Fuel Solar, which is primarily a renewable energy company. Uh, we specialize in energy audits, um, you know, solar energy, um, you know, starting to get into wind as well. And we do it on the residential and commercial, commercial scale. So like Shane, I, I kind of have my hand in a lot of different ways as well. So that's the main, my main focus. But additionally, I, also manage a restaurant um, in St. Lucie Catch 22, uh, which is primarily seafood based. And I, when I do have time, I try to catch my own seafood, the fish and so on to serve at the restaurant. And then the third thing we do on premises, we have a 25 yard um, competition pool. Um, so we would have, my sister and I would have launched our own swim club back in 2017 with the purpose of just bringing more awareness to sport, especially in the north of the island. I mean, growing up, living on the west coast to get to the south coast, you know, for 5.30 a.m. practice, you'd have to get up at, you know, four o'clock. So just making, we had in mind to try to make the sport more accessible for persons who live in the north and the west. And so far, so far it's going, it's going good. Yeah, uh, Ter Terrence, I, I know a bit of that story. Uh, Terrence and I actually were roommates in college and in the same field. Uh, so I, I remember when you were working and, and made that transition. And it's a difficult decision, right? Like to give up something that you've done for so long um, to take on a new project. But there comes that point. And I'm sure, like I've seen the challenges that you had, you know, when you were doing your thesis and saying, okay, I'm gonna now go and work. But for all of you, I was wondering what what was some of the biggest challenges that you faced in your transition that you wish you that yourself today would would what would you whisper in your ear to address those challenges? So what is it? What is the challenge, and what's the advice you would give yourself? Um, seeing what you've seen in your transition into the entrepreneur into the business space i'll start with andrea <laughs> okay so um you know when you're an athlete and you're competing at the highest levels for some reason there's this irrational thing in your head that makes you think that you're invincible and this is going to last forever 
And there comes a point where everyone has to come to the reality that that's just not the case. Um, fortunately for me, when I first got out of college and I started my professional career, I made a decision because after a couple months, I realized, okay, I'm training three hours a day. I'm spending maybe two hours a day with rehab and that kind of stuff. You know, I've got a lot of free time on my hands. So I started my master's, ironically, in something that I've never used. However, <laughs> I got my master's in hotel and restaurant management. Um, but I'm glad that I did that because it gave me something else to think about. I wasn't just completely focused on track and myself. Um, so I'm glad I did that because I really think that it helped me in the socialization aspect, because when you're engulfed in your own sport, that's all you think about, that's all you're surrounded with. So it was really good for me to branch out and learn some other skills. Um, so I definitely think that's important in the transition of an athlete's life to find something else to get involved with. And if it's educating yourself a little bit more, that will always help you in the long run. So that's one piece of advice I would I would say in your transition. Um, really start thinking about what is gonna be the next step and how are you gonna get there? So, you know, really try to start thinking about what interests you have outside of your sport. Um, what, what could you see yourself doing for the rest of your life? Because at the end of the day, the life of an athlete is only so long. So you really need to start thinking about, um, you know, that next step and how you're going to get there. Well, uh, Shane, what about you? Uh, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Yeah, the um, that is is often a, a, a difficult time, as you guys have mentioned. You know, you spend your days and nights uh, obsessing on how to be the best in a particular sport and how do you give it up. Um, in a way, I had multiple factors kind of layer on each other. Uh, my body was starting to wear. Um, I was spending almost as much time in the training room as I was um, practicing in the in the gym. Um, you know, that's a huge sign there. When I reflected back on how I started gymnastics, what some of my earlier goals were, I realized I achieved those goals. I achieved more than those goals. And if you had told, you know, 15 year old me a couple of years later, I was going to be at world championships in the Olympics. I might not have believed you. So I had to recognize that I had achieved a lot. Um, I started to recognize that when I look kind of at the, the world rankings, when I'd come from below 100 and drifted into closer to the middle of that pack. And then my numbers started to drift back towards, you know, the 100 mark. I was like, okay, the, the gains I made, the progress I made, where my realistic projection of the next couple of years might be, I realized that I had plateaued, that there wasn't much more uh, in the sport as far as competitive nature went. And it was about time to, to move on with my life. Um, it was very, it was still very difficult. Um, you know, if, if it was in a different sport and it was uh, a professional option, um, I may have taken a few more years. I dabbled with the idea of going to Cirque uh, or something similar like many of, of my fellow athletes and friends did. And I thought to myself, you know, if I can take a few more years of doing CERT training, why wouldn't I just compete for Barbados instead? And since that wasn't realistic, um, you know, it was time to move on. I was also fortunate that my family business um, had, had room for me in it. Um, that same family business is essentially what had financially supported me through all of my, my training. And so I was actually looking forward to, to giving back in that form to what had supported me and allowed me to go through my gymnastics. And I, I think most of us that have stayed involved in sport in some form, the desire to give back is pretty strong and it's pretty fulfilling. Um, you know, so if you go a corporate route, say that has nothing to do with your sport, but you can help the fulfillment level as a human, as an athlete, as helping other Bajans by giving back to the sport in other ways. That's great. If you can give back directly um, by coaching like I do a bit, that's awesome too. But I think understanding where your place is in the sport, what your goals are, and how you can still reach higher levels of fulfillment when you do move on. Because that transition phase um, you know, I've seen athletes go down a, a bad path and a dark path because they have nothing else 
to fulfill that space and that time and that dedication in their lives. When you, when you find the healthy ways to do that, when you find the positive ways, the fulfilling ways to do that, it can be a, a much better journey for a lot of us. And I don't think everyone addresses how, how dark that period can be for athletes. And, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to be a little more open about that. I'm always open for discussions um, with some of the things I went through. And I think forums like this are amazing for, for bringing it up and letting athletes know the same way there are harder and darker training periods, there will be those harder, those harder transitional periods in and out of your life and your career choices as well, too. And, and just the same way you tackle them as an athlete, you can tackle them as a human being, too. Shane, that's, that's a very so, sobering point. You know, like I, I myself, I experienced that in transition. Many of our fellow swimmers, we've 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 seen that period and other athletes as well. And that is the underlying thing that that you know, informing the athletes commission that would come up when we spoke to former athletes is some persons end up feeling very lost and some persons uh, are who have something to grab onto, they, they, they can throw themselves into that. And sometimes it's a conscious decision and sometimes it just happened to fall in place for those who are lucky. Yes. And so appreciate that point and appreciate your openness. Um, and Terrence, like for you, like what's what's some advice um, that, that you would give your former self or upcoming athletes about preparing for your for their transition? Right. So for me, my transition was, I think, less of really being at my best and more a financial decision. Uh, unfortunately, uh, where I was in two thousand and eight. I wasn't receiving the sponsorship that I would require to maintain, you know, living living abroad and you know the lifestyle of of a, of a swimmer. Um, so my switch was for financial reasons. I think um, I did have. I always knew at the back of my mind that you know swimming is not going to last forever, but I also I never wanted to be defined just by swimming or oh, Terrence he's a swimmer. I like I. I don't, I, I never wanted to be put in a box as, or a Terrence, he can only swim. So I said, well, I have to find a purpose. I think without a purpose in life, like you're lost. So everyone has to find what their purpose is. And then like all these skills are transferable, like, you know, time management, goal setting, discipline. You just transfer that to your new purpose. And I guess one thing that I would have to really highlight is that like, you know, like, not it taken for not forever, but it doesn't happen overnight. Like getting to the top of your sport, it didn't happen overnight. So when you transition and you take all those what the people call soft skills and you put it in towards whatever business venture you have, you have to acknowledge that it will take it will take some time. So the mindset should be, you know, a, a medium term to long term vision in terms of what, what you want to achieve. That's my biggest um, I guess set of advice. I think that's really important because a lot of times, um, for example, if you're an athlete and you compete after college for, let's say, five years, you know, you could be anywhere from 26 to 30. And then you're coming out, you're trying to figure out what's next. And you're fighting for positions with people who've been working for 10 years already and you're just getting started. And that could be really hard and it can play with your mind as far as, you know, can I do this? Am I capable of this? But like Terrence said, you have so many skills that you gain as an athlete, whether it's a collegiate athlete, uh, you know, junior athlete, so many important skills that you just have to realize and figure out how to position yourself and how to market yourself with these skills, because it's really something important to bring to the table. I think people are, companies are really starting to realize the value that collegiate athletes and professional athletes are bringing to the table in addition to whatever skills they already have. Andrew, that's, that's a great, great point. I, I like what you said about, you know, you're coming out of your sport, maybe 29, like in your late twenties, if you continue beyond the collegiate years. And so like, uh, you know, I, like I said, you know, Terrence and I, we live together. I, I continued to try to, 
to make it to 2012 after. And when I got it, even though I was doing, you know, uh, research and work in my field, when I got into my career in renewable energy, it, it, there people my, my age would have had like four years experience on me. Yeah. But, but then I actually had some advice from another Olympian, um, but she was from Bermuda. She was like, don't undersell what you've done because a lot of people cannot commit to something for their entire life. And it's actually the network from swimming that has allowed my work to be successful, uh, me, allowed me to be better at my work. Like, like having that network from going to different places. Uh, so when you travel for work, you can you can connect and understand the local culture a bit better. But but then the ability to speak to multiple cultures is is a skill that I thought was is very useful right now. And I love that you hit on that point because. The, the advice that my friend gave to me was like, do not undersell the fact that you're an athlete. That is actually what could get your foot in the door. And you know, like you don't want to talk about yourself and what you do, Yeah. but sometimes people don't even care about what your background is. If you say that you're Olympian is like, Oh, tell us about that. And it feels weird, you know, like, you know, grew up in bar is not taught to brag or anything, but it is, a way to get your foot in the door and be remembered amongst many applications. That's just being upfront and very real about that. Um, I, so, yeah, go ahead, Shane. I, I like what you mentioned about the, the network you have there. I mean, the, the <clears throat> two of the bigger things that I did in more recent years and, and what happened to bring me back to the US and, and out of Barbados was the connections I made. So some of the guys I competed against in, uh, in college started something called power monkey fitness and power monkey camp and they fly me out twice a year to teach at a camp they they do weekend clinics that uh, when they need my coaching help or i'm close by i'm one of the ones that gets called for that the current facility that i teach in um, is old college teammates uh you know so the the network of of athletes of competitive athletes the the same way a, a maybe a fraternity in college uses that network to assist each other call your old teammates call people who weren't directly your teammates like us send us emails what do you do about this you know use that network that you have whether it be for advice or direct connections and, and a foot in the door as well too because like you guys were saying a, a company that hires um, athletes people who have dedicated themselves to higher level education or long-term athletic work, they understand that takes a lot of hard work and dedication and that those skills are often transferable to any field. So that, that can go a long way for keeping doors open for, for our future athletes as well. No, that, that's such a great point. And like, you have to remember too, right? Like, if, if you're in a certain you know age bracket you're probably transitioning out of sport at the same time as 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 your as your um, peers so like they're going through that that process as well and and instead of you know pulling yourself away during a, uh, the transition out of sport sometimes embracing um, the network like you said Shane is very important um, I know Terence with the, the swim network where we have a very strong bond um amongst our generation uh like 30 plus guys <laughs> guys and girls right <laughs> you know that still keep in contact and and i can attest that that all of them are in different professional spaces right um and so it's our hope also with the arena that we can tap into that you know like it's not a one-stop thing we continue this narrative into the future and like that leads to my question, like, what would you like to see in place for athletes in transition? If we could, you know, call upon the powers that be, what, what would be something that you think would be of value that you've observed in your journey through the sport and into business uh, that could help and, and that we could, as the Athletes Commission, we could utilize our, our position to, to advocate for? Um, like you just mentioned, Martin, um, networking is so important. It's all about networking. 
Um, as an athlete who's transitioning, you need to network with people who are in the career that you want to be in. It's important to network with former athletes. Um, so, I mean, I would like to see uh, some kind of a formal situation where, you know, professional athletes are linked with former professional athletes. And, you know, there's there's a, a flow where they can reach out and, you know, communicate as often as they would like. Um, you know, I do try to stay in contact with, you know, I still stay in contact with Shane. Um, every now and again, I, you know, I touch bases with Akila or Tia Adana. Um, but I, I think it's so important. And um, like Shane mentioned a little bit earlier, the the mental health aspect of a retiring athlete is so critical. Like those first few months are so tough because, you know, you're used to going, going, going. You're used to having that competitive energy. You're used to expending all this, you know, having all this excitement, the traveling and, you know, doing your sport. And then all of a sudden there's nothing. Like, what do you do with that energy? What do you do with that time? How do you fill that space? So these are important conversations that retiring athletes need to have. And no one else is going to un understand that except another retired athlete. And that's just the reality of the situation. So I'd like to see some kind of network, a formal network where athletes can just reach out to other, you know, retired athletes and, and let's talk about this. Like, what are you dealing with? What are you going through? How can I, you know, successfully transition? Like, who do you know in this, this, um, field? field? Yeah. Who, who do you know in this business that I can reach out to? So, so I think that would be pretty helpful. Yeah. Martin, can we, can we set up like a formal mentorship type program? I mean, you know, there's a list of five or 10 or a hundred names that are there. And some of the things that are interesting or, you know, we're willing to share. And, you know, some of our younger athletes maybe don't even have to go directly through you guys, even though they can. And my name and email is on a list and I get, uh, you know, an email from someone who's a junior in college and they're like, man, I have no idea what I want to do or I have an idea of what I want to do. And it sounds like a, a similar path that you took, you know, and, and those mentorships can be either super formal or, or informal. I think that would be amazing. Yeah. I mean, because example, if I'm if I'm in college right now and I'm an engineer, who should I talk to? <laughs> Terrence yeah. is right here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because because if, if you're in college and you don't know, yeah. I mean, you, you just don't know. And it, it helps to talk to someone who's been on that path before. Yeah. Sure. And especially yeah. with someone who like Terrence, who tried to do both at the same time, yeah. you know, he can walk someone through what the challenges are, what he would probably do differently had he had the chance to do it again. Yeah. And even just knowing that it's, you, it's not only you. It's, it's it's not a unique thing. It's okay to to not know or have it figured out. Yeah. You know that. You know for sure. That that's that's a key part. But to, to answer both of your questions, um, part of my team two four six is not just the website. Where we've developed a community, which we hope to serve as a community of practice, where we can set up mentoring networks. Each of the associations and uh, sporting associations can have their own space. So we can tag entire associations. And and so we'll be launching that along with the platform. And we ask people, we'll, we'll ask, and that's for for members of the, of the associations. Um, but but I love that you guys brought that up because I think it's it's where is where we're at right now. Um, and Terrence, not to count you, out, count you out there, I'd love to hear what you would like to see. Um, yeah. I, I echo I echo pretty much the same statements that uh, Andrea and Shane made. Um, I just want to underscore the thought. I think it's becoming more and more important now, uh, especially you know, given even the COVID environment. I think the mental health element is is so important, and it's something that you know when we were swimming, it was not as big as it should be. It's the mental the mental health and um, resolve of of the transition athlete. And uh, I know, I mean, big up to, to Janelle, Janelle Mears. I know she does some work, mental health work with athletes and transitioning. So I think, um, I think really looking to have someone there 
almost on a full time basis to help you know help athletes transition from a mental health standpoint is is, is critical. So. Yeah, no, oh, that's a great point. And you mentioned the COVID nineteen environment, right? Because you know it's not just athletes; it's businesses, and you guys are <laughs> are in, has ha, has being being an athlete has that helped you in this time of COVID in terms of is there a skill that you draw on during it or has it been a bit again un, I, or it could be a mixed bag you know i'm not saying that you're an athlete and that you you can handle anything but um you andrew made the point about the skills that we have that might be unaccounted for and and so i was wondering if 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 you if you draw on that athletic experience as a business person in a COVID nineteen environment, in any way, or have you not thought about it? <laughs> or... um, I think for me, so the way my I was introduced to COVID, I was actually at the indoor national championship when life got pulled out from under us. So here we were getting ready to have the biggest meet of our lives. And before the meet could even start, it was over. We had to get right back on the plane and come back home. So I think for me, my mindset as an athlete was, was, okay, things don't always go your way. Sometimes you just have to pivot and adjust and, you know, move on. So that was very important for me to talk to my team about at that moment. But as the next following, you know, at that time we were like, oh, this will be over in a month. We'll be good. We'll be back to life as normal. Six weeks max. Um, of course, we were all dead wrong. But I think for me, I automatically, because I was at home, we weren't working, we weren't going into office, all the kids went home. And I think for me, I just reverted to, okay, Andrew, get on a schedule. Just create a schedule. So I started laying out a schedule for myself I mean, it was filled with a lot of nothing, but I mean, getting up and working out at 8 a.m., it meant so much for me mentally, like, because I had something to do. I ha I was on a schedule and I knew I had to keep that schedule because I had, if I didn't, I'd just lay in the bed till noon and then what would happen? So I think that was one thing that I was able to draw on during COVID was, okay, let's get discipline, let's get on a schedule, let's keep things moving so that, you know, I can stay in a good mental space because I, I saw a lot of people struggle. Yeah. I think one of those those things with the, the athlete mindset and when you're in training, so most of us have some version of an off season that's a little lighter. You might do things like your, your social activities, et cetera. And when it comes closer and closer to season and your peaking periods, there's almost nothing else that happens. You, you know, you train, you recover, you fuel, you sleep. These kind of things become just a, a, a mini world into yourself. And I feel like that's a bit of COVID life as it is, you know, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm like, can I go out to a restaurant for six months? Well, no, but I'm also, I wouldn't have done that when I was in a training phase either. Right. So it, it was sort of a parallel to some of those tougher, really focused phases, even though like you were just saying, there might be no focus <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> at times, but at least the like, why am I not seeing friends? Why am I not going out and just, you know, spending two hours at the movie and two hours at dinner and, and lounging on the beach or something like, okay, that's because that's not in this training phase, the master plan. So that was very helpful. Now you mentioned working out as well too. I think that's one of the things that, I mean, this is going to be very individual to our athletes as they transition. Some of these athletes and some of us absolutely need that physical outlet, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes doing your same sport is maybe even a bad idea. Like I stayed the hell away from my sport for a couple of years. You know what I mean? I, I really did. There was almost some, some trauma responses with some of it there for a while. I picked up archery at a BOA Olympic day and ended up competing for Barbados for a couple of years for archery. I, you know, Terrence and some of the other swimmers I met in the water surfing. Um, you know, I did archery competitively. And when I started surfing, I was like, I love this. I don't want to compete in it. But I had a lot of physical outlets over the years that helped me mentally in my transition. You know, and I, I think that for some of our athletes, recognize that. You know, some of you guys hate the, the grind of training. 
um, and you love competition only. Um, and so the, the grind of, of, you know, working out may not be for you. Some people hated competition. They love the grind and the challenge of training. And so you can pick anything and do that. You can be a runner, you can be a swimmer, you can be a CrossFitter, it won't matter. You just need to put it on your schedule and have that outlet for, for both your physical and mental health, whether the world is running as it normally does or has been turned upside down. Yeah, yeah. there's some principles of like clinical behavioral therapy that you can apply, like making lists, scheduling, working out, you know, like it, it, it's a great outlet. And I mean, I, could, I can attest to that. Like, I think I did adult gymnastics at one point tried to i literally like the mushroom horse <laughs> yeah but, circles on the mushroom yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i can't really do the full horse yeah and then muay thai surfing and and it's like finding a sport and track at one point but we, swimmers are not track athletes <laughs> <laughs> we got in long capacity but you know like we, we can maintain that but but you know terrence like i've seen you 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 put your effort terrence into not just doing other sports and us going surfing and that sort of thing. But I seen you like really put effort into your coaching um, and, and working and, and building the pool that you did. Um, any, any other advice you, you would say? Um, going back to the same COVID, I mean, I think really aligning yourself, like I think humans, we are, we are very bad medium and long-term thinkers i think trying to align yourself as much as possible to that medium term like you know three years four year kind of like thinking of thinking of uh, like olympia like right you you have you have you know four years and then you break it down into you know every year and then you break it down to every month and then every week right so it's like i think andrea had mentioned you know it's not every every competition is going to be good you're going to have bad seasons but you know, it's okay to, to lose a lot of once you win the war kind of mindset is that you have to have that long-term, yeah. long-term mindset. And I think the other thing that I would say, which I got from my father, which is a parallel from swimming is that, you know, at the end of the race, he always used to tell me, you know, you know, the person next to you is not a robot, you know, you're hurting, they're hurting too. <laughs> so it's like, everyone's going through the same thing. So you might sometimes think that the problems are unique to us, but everyone is in the same boat. Everyone's trying to make it through. Well. Yeah, and that speaks to the resilience. I mean, that that that's like a theme that would go through business, through sport, and as a nation, right? Um, and I, I I notice like each of each of your businesses has that kind of like social contribution, um, whether it's on the health side um, or even Terrence on the climate change side. So I I, I appreciate you guys for what you're doing. And I appreciate the time here. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, so what you need to do is type your questions in the comment section, and I'll take a look at them. And and then I'll, I'll, I'll direct them to who you want me to direct them to. And if no questions come up, I, I have some. <laughs> yeah so so as 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 people get used to the functionality or if if there are no questions as yet i i wanted to 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 dive a bit further um you guys have had support in terms of family or friends um What's some advice that you would give to someone who's a supporter now, um, who has, say a parent that has a young athlete that is about to transition on sport or prepare, helping them prepare their career um, and knowing that that will come to an end? What's, what's something that you would advise a parent? This is a, a really great one. Uh, I'm actually very curious in other sports as well, too. Um, what I found in gymnastics, the high percentage of successful gymnasts have had parents who support, but don't 
directly influence you know the the idea that you need a ride to practice i'll give you a ride to practice you need to sleep in on the weekends i'll let you sleep in you need watch for fueling i'll help you with that it's not parents like you have to go to practice and forcing food down their throat or what whatever the the version of that is i'm curious one if that is similar in other sports that parents who are supportive without being overbearing tend to create a more successful environment and will that transition into the the rest of the world like hey as your parent as your long-term friend you might not be able to see this but this might be a really good path for you to explore and if you want some help or support in that i can do it but not saying like you have to go to college you have to get a corporate job after this oh you you want to wing it for a while and start your own business and you might need to live live in my basement for six months I, I could maybe do that, you know. I, I don't know how this transitions again into to the other sporting world or the real life world, but I feel like that's where my instinct is saying we should be as a support system. Like this might be crazy, but it might work. That's how some of us got to the Olympics. Is that how we can help people get to their their life fulfillment as well, too? Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. Uh, 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 Andrea, any thoughts for? Um, you know, I, I would advise parents to be patient. It's going to take some time. Um, I, I do agree with Shane that parents who are more supportive and not in it and it's so invested in it personally tend to have more successful kids who are athletes. Um, but it's going to take time. And I would advise a parent to throw suggestions out there, be encouraging, you know, encourage your kid to explore all options. You know, don't, don't think that, oh, I can't try that because it's too late or I can't try that because I never did it before. You never know unless you try. And I always tell, you know, athletes in my group, you know, just try, you know, nothing, just, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, move on to something else. Um, but don't feel that that intense, oh, I have to, you know, be in my career right this second because, you know, so-and-so I graduated high school with is doing X, Y, Z. You know, you really have to take your time and, and get it right. It's more important to get it right than to get it done right now. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, over you, Terrence. Any other yeah, I, think, I think the biggest thing I would say for parents is, um, Kind of similar to what Shane was saying is like my whole thing is to lead by example. So there's a lot of value in demonstrating the sort of skills that you want your children to have without like directly te like telling them do this, do that, right? Because mm -hmm. the child's gonna eventually resent you <laughs> if you're always on their case, right? So just um just being involved and you know having a lot of the same behaviors that you would want them to, to have or to, to emulate, I think that's probably the biggest the biggest thing. Yeah. I, I would agree with all of you um, on, on that and, 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 and having parents that understand that you're, you're in a murky place, you know, and sometimes in a murky place, and, but, but that you could figure it out that that's very important. Actually, we have a question from the one and only Akilah Jones coming through for you guys. So I got to got to ask it. Um, how early or late in your career did you guys start thinking about transitioning out of your sport? Um, I think I started too late. Um, for, fortunately for me, I ended up going down the coaching path. So it the transition wasn't, you know, I'd begun volunteer coaching. So I would do that with my afternoons after I finished practicing in the morning. Um, so that was an easier transition. Now, had it not been coaching, I would have been in trouble. Um, so I don't think it's ever too early to start thinking about that, because like I said, um, I ended up retiring because I got injured um, and the injury just, you know, once you get once you hit 30 injuries, healing can, you know, <laughs> it can take forever. So um, so my, you know, retirement was pretty sudden. Um, so I, I think it's something you should always have in the back of your mind. They'd never think that it's too late. And as you're competing or as you're still in your, you know, training, like that's a great time to try different things 
And if you don't like it, you move on, you know, volunteer somewhere for a couple hours. If you don't like it, you move on, you know, do, do some different things that you, you know, you, you have, I mean, the truth is, even if you're, if all you're doing is being a professional athlete, you, you've got some free time in your hands. Yeah. So use it wisely. That's, that would be my advice. Yeah, and for our younger athletes, I think the um, the idea to to take that time, you know, when you're say forty years old and you're more worried about retirement, or you might happen to have a family, that is a crazier time to transition from one job yeah. to another. You can still do it; lots of people do, but it's a crazier time to do it. It's a lot easier to do it when you're twenty or twenty-five or thirty. So, if you have some of these ideas, I, I think take. The, the opportunity in your youth to do it. I did something, you know, I, I was interested in carpentry. I did construction work in my earlier years and it made me realize real fast that I wanted a college education. So, you know, my, my gap year go. wasn't traveling Europe. My gap year was swinging a hammer. So, you know, that, that I, I just think that that idea of doing those things. Now, if you know you want to be a lawyer, if you know you want to be a doctor, those are pretty firm paths. I mean, there is some leeway in those from what I understand, but those people usually put the same kind of focus we do into sport, into those career paths. But we're talking here about an entrepreneurship career path that is often a roller coaster. You know, the number of times I saw business ideas of my father's fail um, before one's got good. Now that I'm in my forties, the number of business ideas I've had that have failed, uh, you know, they're, they're vast as well too. Just like sport, you will fall and it's getting back up. That oftentimes is, is more important. So keep those ideas flowing all throughout. And that one that keeps coming back to you from the time you're a teenager to your twenties, to your thirties, you know, maybe you, start that brewing company when you're 35 maybe you do it right out of college who knows right these these things need to be kept in mind like you were saying and and explore those opportunities well that's great great advice uh terence what about you um in terms of aquila's question i started thinking too well too not too late but for me if someone had told me while i was still swimming only that I would have to stop swimming and you know find a career I would have been like no man I can do it I can do it I can do it both so it took me trying to do it myself to realize I can't do it in order to to, to fully transition because I think one thing about being an athlete is kind of sometimes you're stubborn in, in your own beliefs and your own ways and you kind of have to go through certain things in order to realize what is and what's not for you um, or what you can or what you can't do so and I, I just want to add one thing. I never in a million years would have dreamt that I was going to be a full-time college coach. Never. So, you know, like I said, I started uh, volunteering and I was like, okay, this is cool. I like this. You know, I think I can see myself doing this. So, you know, don't be afraid to try things because you never know. But I, I, I honestly had no idea I, this is where I would be. Yeah. No, I, I actually listening to you guys it just triggers something I thought of you know like when we were in college Terrence remember we, we used to watch like when YouTube first came out that's when we were in college like 2004 or 5 or 6 around that time and what I realize with athletes today they they have like created their brands and they've been able to to do that during their career um and maybe I, we had one friend um, who was, you know, he was into making T-shirts. He's from Bermuda. And when we were at Olympics, you know, like he was selling T-shirts and getting into photography. And, and he was able to transition and write a book, uh, you know, like based on his career when he got injured. And I thought that was something that I thought was impressive uh, because he leveraged what was around him uh, in order to 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 move his skill set beyond the pool um and i thought that was cool so just a comment there they had a question come up just now but it's gone anicia would you mind putting that back up uh as he on. pulls that one up your your comment about not thinking you'd be a full-time coach i i was there as well you know i i gave back in in chunks here and there with sport 
the other sports I, you know, when I picked up archery, people wanted me to help them. And, and I took my certifications just so I could, but I just kept getting drawn back into full-time coaching. So, you know, this is again, where I say, leave some of those possibilities open yeah. earlier in your career. I, I, I don't see the question up, but from what I gathered from it, it was um, from Jules and it was to have, have you, have you guys been utilized more formally by national associations and other bodies, um, given your experience? Um, it was more of a comment and a question. I think you, they, they were trying to get across the point that athletes, okay, so here it is. Uh, Michael Jewell says, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this forum. I believe that persons like yourself should be utilized more formally in the advancement of sport in Barbados. Do the national associations use you guys? Take, for example, Andrea, who is a coach at the NC2A level. The ABB should, the AAB should be reaching out to her and all the other Barbadian coaches and use them to assist with scholarships for athletes. Congrats on your achievements. Uh, oh, yeah. So I think I got the gist of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't say there's been anything formal with the AAB. Um, definitely the BOA has reached out to me on different occasions to do you know, either speak to teams or, you know, one year I went to Commonwealth Games and I spoke with some athletes there, you know, talking about mental preparation before, you know, I remember having a really fun session with the netball team over in uh, Manchester. So, yeah, there have been various opportunities, but um, I mean, like I say, I, I always believe in giving back. I received so much from Barbados that I will never be able to repay. So anytime I have opportunity to help or give back, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, when I was still in Barbados, I, I served on the Gymnastics Association for a while. Um, there have been times when a few of our athletes have uh, started to show some promise towards the international level and competing on the international level. So like you were saying, any questions that come my way, whether it's from those athletes, from the Gymnastics Association or the BOA, um, have been able to help. I'm sure if someone asked you, you know, since you're in the NCAA coaching world right now, what are the coaches actually really looking for? What do I need to do to make myself more marketable? I'm sure you'd be open to those kind of questions once you're not violating any NCAA rules. And, and you know, what's interesting is from what I understand, I assume it's still the same as the BOA has been one of the best associations in the Caribbean about utilizing funds, um, training, education stuff, uh, IOC grants, right? And, and what you guys are doing now with this forum and, and the extensions of it, I'm hoping that is the same thing we're seeing, that, is that the BOA and, and the parent of, of these athletic associations is making as many opportunities available. And so the advice that we give and that other athletes give, the more of that we implement is the more that the BOA and our extension um, associations can, can really be useful to our athletes. And, and Terrence, uh, what about you? Yeah, I think, um, Likewise, uh, to, to share the same sentiments that Andrea mentioned, like the sport, like I am so grateful for the opportunity I had. And, you know, the sport swimming has done so much for me. So if I can even, you know, in a small way, uh, you know, positively impact, you know, a swimmer's life or someone's uh, up and coming athlete, I try to do so. Um, I am on the board for the business committee for, for BASA. Um, just to help further the sport, I think, um, unfortunately, in the sport of swimming, I don't know if it's the same with other sports in the island. There's a lot of politics. And I think sometimes that, and that ends up detracting and taking away from the development of, of the athletes. So I think um, I think it's very important to for, for all parties involved to try to have a, as much as possible as an objective mindset towards the sport in terms of helping the whole sport and having an unbiased, I guess, view. Yeah. Uh, and I would encourage, you know, persons like, not persons, but entities like the San Basa and the Olympic Association to, to keep reaching out to, you know, former swimmers and former athletes to to really do more, more stuff of this type. So like forums, uh, mentorship programs, um, just coming up and doing mental health 
the speeches. Um, it, it goes a long, it goes a long way. Like I, I remember, I still remember when Liam Martindale came and spoke to spoke to me. You know, so it don't I I would say do not underscore how important the little things are to to the up and coming athletes. Just someone taking a few minutes to talk to them. I think that's that's important. Uh, I, I I couldn't agree more. And like um, to uh, Mr. Jules' question, like you know the the Barbados Aquatic Sports Association reaches out to the Olympians in general um, to get involved, especially more now. You know what has happened with COVID. A lot of us were cheering on Alex Sobers and Daniel Titus and trying to engage them as they were approaching Tokyo. Uh, so. Uh, there is room for greater involvement and that that begs to a question you know like i i feel like there's a space for the private sector a corporate barbados to get more involved i mean terence mentioned leah and nikki and you know like nikki was in nikki's interesting because we grew up looking up to nikki and leah and then there came a stage when we were competing with them so we were traveling with them and it went more from, you know, this is like a mentor who would guide us on trips to this is our friend. And now they've transitioned into their careers. And it just the other day I was driving and I heard Nikki on an ad for Sagicor because he's a financial advisor, right? So, so I was like, whoa, you know, like what athletes can do for corporate uh, entities is huge as well. So, I mean, you know, we help them with their brand and with the marketing and I think this is just my opinion, and I wonder if you guys agree with this. There's an opportunity for us to position ourselves as Bayesian athletes uh, to engage more with corporate Barbados. And I, I, I would like to say, you know, corporate Barbados could, you know, for me, it would be cool if corporate Barbados had some sort of like internship program that, you know, engage with athletes because they're going to go through that transition. So it could be more than just, um, when there's an event we call on them to take part it could be a structured thing where athletes can now have a transition pathway developed that's just me based on what you guys were saying and thinking about what i observed in the last little while but i wonder your thoughts on have you seen that because you guys have been around the world have you seen that set up in some places i know uh, team canada i've seen some of their athletes transition into into different areas because the owners of those businesses were athletes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I, you I think you see some of it, like you're saying, there's a direct connection on some of those. Um, I, I do remember a lot of my peers that went corporate uh, through the US system. There almost seemed to be like job fairs at the university in the college of business so that these potential employers came in to hire people out of that university. I'm, I'm wondering if there can be a system like that for the athletes as well. Do some of the universities in the, the U S now do that? Uh, I'm not sure because like you were saying, you know, if a certain university is known for their medical program or their legal program or their business program, those entities are going to want to go to that university to hire those candidates. What about the the companies that know high level athletes perform well in the corporate sector as well? Can we have an athlete's job fair for these things that that have internships built in, like you're mentioning? That would be a great opportunity as well, too. Appreciate that. Well, any any other comment? Any other thoughts on that? Or? I think I'll just add that I believe that. Um, I think it's kind of a chicken or the egg scenario. I think it's it'd be good to have corporate Barbados involved or corporate in general, not necessarily in Barbados, but I think we need to do more to highlight our athletes, to put them in the spotlight, and which would then facilitate the, you know, people wanting a sponsorship and say, well, we have this person working with us as a, as a highlight. I don't think there's enough attention to our to our, to our local office. And unfortunately, there's still the mindset that sport is, I don't think we, I personally don't think we take sport seriously in Barbados or as seriously as we should. So I think that that that, that is the first thing we need to do um, in terms of getting corporate Barbados eventually. Um,
I'm working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Um, I was fortunate when I was uh, competing professionally, the nation newspaper sponsored me. Um, but, you know, that it doesn't happen nearly often enough, you know, and I honestly probably wouldn't have been able to have had the length of career that I had had it not been for the nation. Um, I think there may have been maybe one other scenario. I believe Akila has a sponsorship. Oba had one as well. But, you know, it, it's it's so hard, but you're right. We have to put our athletes up front and we have to, you know, highlight their achievements and a little bit more and highlight, you know, what they're doing off the pool or track or, or you know, what, what makes them attractive for a company to want to, you know, have them on their team because at the end of the day, you know, it's the, the company has to be feeling as though they're getting the work. So, you know, it's very important that we're highlighting the strengths of our athletes. No, 100%. And, you know, as athletes, some of the things that we get into, we fit into the broader national discussion. Like right now, you see, we just had the UNCTAD conference here in Barbados, and, you know, you, you, hit, you had the prime minister. You know, she was speaking about trade, about business, about about things affecting the economy, also about climate change, right? And you know, there there the and health, right? There's so much that we can advocate for if we're interested in it. So I, I think this is something for us to explore further. But I have a question coming in here from Craig Archer. Hi, Craig. Hope you're doing well. See you in a while. Uh, all of us are familiar with Craig. <laughs> How can the BOA do more than we are doing now? In Craig's opinion, he thinks that the BOA needs to be more, do more to publicize and promote Bayesian athletes via billboards, posters, etc. In his view, the publicity will be made will make it easier for the current and former athletes to probably state they are athletes and this will help networking and prospects um i i, I any anyone anyone thoughts on that that sounds pretty similar to what we just heard as well too that the promotion can kind of go both ways right yeah um, interestingly enough when when our names pop up on the screen what do we, the three of us have at the end of our names right now <laughs> oil, the, the, the oil y right the ollie yeah. so i mean that's one there when someone puts you know phd or md or whatever on their you, you know you know what i mean like you see these 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 names with that and if an employer or potential employer doesn't know on our resumes they can then see that you know what i mean yeah. so that would that would help or does help us at this status that we're at now which was nice of the ioc to get that going i believe it was them that mm -hmm. did that yep um, but yeah. does Barbados have something for our national athletes that were maybe only, you know, Crypto, CAC, Pan Am, Commonwealth Games athletes? So those are still high level athletes that put a lot of time and effort into it. Those skills all transfer, transfer to the corporate worlds like we're talking about, but they don't have an OLY on their name. Is there a way we can denote those athletes? You know, yeah. I love that point. Um, it makes me think to answer that question. Not, not to jump ahead of you guys, uh, but building on what Shane was saying, there's a story that is happening with the athletes going through these processes. So, you know, like when we see how we're publicized, the media might see us as a result. So when there's an event, there's some hype about the event and what did they come, you know, like sometimes it can be very detrimental how we're publicized. Um, but I think... I think investing in the story and the progress, the lifestyle, have people understand what those sports are and maybe in a campaign about the different types of sports. Because even though there are new sports like skateboarding that are coming on, that surfing. someone might be surfing, skateboarding, yeah. And 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 we're right there with it, you know. We have Jade Nichols, we have we have Chelsea, Chelsea Twak, you know, like yeah. Barbados Punch is above its weight and Very much so. athletes are doing it and sometimes it can be isolating um but the whole purpose of my team 246 is for us you know like it was great traveling on teams and you get to interact with your other athlete players like we are one team barbados and i think what the boa could do is 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 invest in those telling those stories and and connecting to the broader um challenges that country might be facing but Terrence, I know you and I have talked about this 
from a from a water safety standpoint you know like um you you spend a lot of time it isn't even about the sport it's about the ability to appreciate the water and i was just wondering if you mind sharing a bit about we've had those discussions for, for a while now calling you out bro i call you out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going into I mean I have a special a special place in my heart for swimming. Obviously, I think um, you know I, we've been saying this Martin for a while that swimming needs to be mandatory in the school curriculum. Like every like every every person needs to know how to swim, and it, it it hurts my heart when I see you know every year you know unfortunately you know someone someone drowns. Does everyone knowing how to swim would that stop drowning? Absolutely not, but it reduces it reduces your chances. The chances um and i just see swimming as being a sport into so many other sports like you just mentioned surfing and there's there's sailing like all these all these prerequisites you have to you have to know how to swim so I, I really encourage the powers that be to do everything in their power to make it compulsory um in the curriculum yeah mm -hmm. well i i um I was wondering, Andrea, is anything to Craig's question you think that they can do? Uh, um, I mean, I, I just agree that, you know, the promotion is so important. Like, we should know who every member of the Barbados Olympic team is, who the Barbados Commonwealth, like, their names should be, I should automatically know who they are, where they went to school, you know, what, what their interests are. You know, I, I just think it's... It's such a simple thing, simple idea, but it's so important. Like as Bajans, we should have pride in who we're sending to teams and we should know we need to be invested in that as a as a country. So yeah, definitely if we can promote the individuals a little bit more, I think I think that'll be better. Yeah, I agree. And who they were, you know, like there's there's legacy. I mean even take Leah. I mean, as kids, we looked up to Leah. Leah's first uh, black female finalist, finalist yeah, yeah. in 1996. That's huge, right? You know, and 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 so she broke down barriers, and you know, and is always giving back. Um, so yeah, I I think I think it's important. I think that's a resounding. We need to know the story more <laughs> across the board. Um, we have a question here from Corey Graves. Do you think there's a need for a better channel to national athletes? The media is usually hindered in their communication and are limited to track meets. A directory or a method to contact the national athletes that will allow those athletes to know this is a legitimate Beijing media person trying to promote their story? Mm. Mm. One, one thing that I would suggest to athletes is your social media and your social media handles. For example, if I know Tia Dana Bell, I should be able to go on Instagram, Twitter, Tia Dana Bell and not see. And I say this as a recruiter, you know, I may go on social media looking for someone and find out that it's hot girl Susie is their handle, right? You know, that kind of stuff. Athletes just have to be aware that they're a product. They're they're marketing themselves. So if I'm looking for Susan Smith, I should be able to go Susan Smith track and field and find them, and not be looking right. for you know, not end up finding. Yeah, that's, you get that's, the point. That's an excellent. That's an excellent point. And I would say the same thing goes for email. Like I mean, I've seen <laughs> seven resumes, and you won't believe what they email addresses. I'm like, hey. no. Exactly. So yeah, I agree. I agree fully with that point. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, athletes should take a little bit of responsibility in that as far as, you know, because a media person should be able to automatically find your you on Twitter or Instagram and you know DM you and you know it, it yeah. shouldn't be that hard. I see the point the other way too, like you know, Andrea, if I was gonna if I Googled you and I look at the university's website, I can tell you are who you are. I can see what your email address, your yes. EU email address is. And, you know, so the, the maybe the same thing needs to go there. Like we can go to a lot of site and, and figure out what the current 
banned substance lists are? Can we go to a press? Is there a world, a world press site where you know that comes both ways as well too? I don't know. It sounds as though some of the things that you guys have lined up um, for the athletes commission stuff that maybe the press can be integrated into that pr pretty smoothly. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that uh, like I said, the the community of practice part to the Team Two Four Six website um, is where we are looking to have. You know, you can have different groups on there. We could have a media group. We can have right. the DOA can have a group, um, medical group, support. You know, but also like athlete and specific sports, and and so this is this is part of this is part of the uh, the design. You know, like figuring out hearing from the athletes, really having that athlete-centered voice, um, you know, no hierarchy, direct, you know, we we are a team, you know, um, that's that's the point. And I, I noticed Craig also mentioned that that now the BOA website, which was redone, they, they also have um, the list of the medalists and who they are on there. And so there, there's there's a effort to, to, to start there's recognition that this is where we need to build, especially going into 2024, I believe. Um, so Glenn Clark, hi Glenn, um, is following with a question. He would like to know, do we believe that Barbados should be developing its own high performance program? And if so, what should it look like? Um, absolutely, yes. Um, what should it look like? complex question um, but I just feel like there should be some situation where a student athlete graduates from college and they at least have a support system for that first year two years coming out of the collegiate system where they can train and prepare for you know at least two years because I see too many and I'm sure it happens in other sports too. Too many track and field athletes graduate from college. They're 22 years old. They haven't even hit their prime yet. And they have to retire because there's just no avenue. There's absolutely zero avenue for them to continue. So it's it's open for discussion, absolutely. Um, but I, I do think there has to be something that you know athletes can be supported through that that period. Definitely. Yeah, sounds like something uh, Terrence would have been would have been up your alley. Would have would have made some of your decisions a little easier around that time. Yeah, Absolutely. For sure. For sure. And like I said, if I didn't have the Nation newspaper sponsor me right out of college, there's no way I would have had to make those tough decisions. You know, like you have to. There comes a point where you have to decide, make a living, or continue your sport. Right. Because not everybody has families who can support their dreams in that way. Yeah, and I would I would say you know with the high performance too is like what we're doing now and being able to codify our experiences and and make it public. You know, like we 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 make it more efficient for up and coming athlete. You know, like especially at a high performance level. Um, you know, if all of us who've been achieved that Olympic status were in a room and we just condensed all our lessons learned, you know, occasionally or through a working group, that could contribute to the knowledge of the high performance center and that would and that could vest be vested within uh, it could be there on record for, for persons who because I remember when I was young, anything was swimming we would, like when when internet was like dial up. You know, you're looking for results in all these like sketch sites just to get results. Like, like when you want to achieve something, it's like, you are insane. You're gonna find it. Yeah, you're myopic, and so yeah. So I think there's there's an opportunity. Um, the only thing I want to add to is I think um, I know it's, it's it's true for swimming and probably a lot of other sports is that we have so many kids that have potential in the sport and they will come and maybe be there for a season or two seasons and then drop the sport either for financial reasons or maybe the, there's some issues in the home or you know other reasons i think i would like to see that the national associations have some sort of 
I know how easy it would be, but some sort of like scout or someone that can really identify the talent to stop the kid. Because Martin, I, I'm pretty sure you could name three or four people that would have would have gone on to make the Olympics for Barbados if they did decide to to stay in the sport. You know, um, so I think having someone there, I can. I know how easy it is. It's probably not the most practical thing, but I, it's hard to see a kid that has talent and you know all the right makings for a really athlete just start and then stop. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I know in swimming, we've seen athletes that for their age, when we were like twelve and fourteen and whatnot, like they were like top in the world, you know. Um, and then life happens. Um, but to that point, you know, what I was thinking was like every school in Barbados has like a games teacher or whatnot. Maybe there's a way to create some sort of liaison program where, for recognizing that talent and like having more of a dialogue with the actual games teachers, you know, who, you know, will see some of these kids. And, you know, like speaking from, you know, being a hyperactive person, you know, like, in, in, in Barbados school system, you demonstrate hyperactivity or any sort of like you want any sort of spectrum, you, you, you you're, you're kind of like isolated. Right. Whereas I know for a fact, if it didn't have sport, it would have been wildness. Right. And I think there's the opportunity for that. Like like we talk about mental health and we talk about these type of things. Um, you can harness that entrepreneurialism and you can harness that athleticism uh by creating stronger avenues with those schools i think and some of the greatest entrepreneurs actually are the ones that question authority <laughs> and so sure. you know that question everything yeah question everything you know <laughs> yeah exactly right you know like more successful people um and and you know as as an island we talk a lot about entrepreneurship and so hopefully athletes could be right there um in the mix <laughs> uh well I, i'd like to to first off i'd like to to mention that you know we were going to do a virtual shirt toss but most of our jo people joining us are joining us on youtube so the prizes will come a little later in the week as we progress um and what that is there's an opportunity to win uh my team 246 uh shirts um as we build the campaign um so just stay engaged for the upcoming sessions. And I would like to formally thank you, Andrea, Shane, and Terrence um, for taking part in this. Uh, I know you made the time and you have, Shane, you're actually at the gym right now. You showed us before. So I know, you know, you, you, you're committed. And, and I know, Terrence, you got a coach. And Andrea, I know it's really early. Probably That's pretty okay. So, so I also have to say, um, Tomorrow we'll have Akila Jones, um, who is an Olympian and also a creative director. Uh, she she'll be speaking tomorrow um, at 5 p.m. So join us for that, um, and and she'll be speaking about balancing career and sport because she's she has a business and she's an active athlete and she's very good at marketing what she does. Her passion comes through. So look out for that. That should be engaging. Awesome. But again, guys, any closing comments or anything you like to us to finish off with or message you like to to give the audience before you sign off? Um, I just want to um, give my email address if anyone has any questions or want to get in contact with me. It's a blacket at apu.edu. Um, love to hear from you. Um, I'm here to help when I love to be a part of the future of sport in Barbados. Same. Yeah. Glad, glad I could be a part of this forum and love what I'm hearing is, is this is going to look like going forward. Um, and my handle is BIMFLIP. So BIMFLIP Instagram, webpage.com and at Gmail for contact as well too. Yeah. And same um, goes for me. Uh, thanks for having this forum. I think it's very important to have forums like this and I'm always available. Um, Terrence Haynes at goldfieldsolar.com. That's my email. I know I can give my Instagram because I got one of them names. <laughs> <Now we talk. laughs> yeah. I joke in, it's like Finman246. But <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, what, what we'll be doing is um, 
like I said earlier, there's a community component to my team 246, and we're going to ask you guys as panelists to register there, and we can tag you, and, okay. and, and that'll be a better way for us to, not a better way, but that's an additional way for us to catalog, you know, the, the, the audience they can, the athletes can sign up, and it's a network where we, we get to know each other and create profiles. So uh, thank you, and everyone. Remember, uh, this is for athletes by athletes. So uh, thank you for joining us for the arena and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Awesome. All right, take care. Cheers. Bye -bye. Have a good one.